Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusco here for another edition of the show. So we're gonna do a little bit of a departure from wine today. We're gonna do some ciders. Now, why would I do a cider? Well, one, they, they, they were sent to me um, by, uh, whatchamacallit, by a representative of the Cedar, I'm sorry, Cedar Brothers. And uh, they got a little thing here, a little, Awesome paperwork, actually. Give you a little primer on how cedar works. Ooh, it's not these lights. It's these lights over here that light up the green screen. A little hot. Anyway, um, so anyway, so uh, I got an, an inquiry to uh, see if I'd do some cider. And I was like, why not? It's a fermented beverage. So that's why I'm like, you know what? Cedar, I mean, a side cedar. Cider is fermented. Beer is also fermented, but we're not going to become a beer show. There's plenty of those out there. I don't need to become another one. Um, but uh, so I was like, sure, why not? Um, so it's 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 kind of a cool little thing. This is the William Tell. Uh, well, let's go over cider real quick. What how how it's made and all that. So cider is a fermented uh, beverage made from apples. Um, now. It's been around for a very, very long time, as this little thing here says. And uh, see, things since the dating back as far as Romans, Greece, and Egyptians. Um, it was very popular. Matter of fact, it was one of the. Uh, it was considered the drink of choice, and they and back in the colonial days, they were drinking 32 gallons per capita. Um, when prohibition happened, uh, of course, besides all other alcohol, cider um, consumption fell by quite a bit. Um, and then when they uh, repealed prohibition in '33, the um, all the gro the apple orchards had been uh, replaced with other crops. So because um, they had to make money somehow, right? <clears throat> anyway, um, so one of the things about this cider, and compared to say what they call like mass-produced ciders, these are craft ciders, is that they're using uh, cider apples. Now, I, I kind of knew, but I didn't really know before I did the research on this. Uh, you have regular apples, and then you have cider apples. Well, regular apples are called dessert apples, and they, um, they're they not typically used for artisan or craft ciders, whereas um, other big, you know, big uh, production, I guess, houses will use those. So um, cider trees take about five years to mature, similar to grapevines. You know, take a little while. You, don't, you can't just plant it in and one or two years be making wine, well you could, I guess you could make wine from some of those grapes, but you're not going to be making quality wine. Um, but uh, take about five years to mature, and uh, they are somewhat of a rarity in the United States. In England, where cider, I'm going to say cider wasn't invented, obviously, if the Egyptians and the Romans and the Greeks were doing it, but England loves their cider, and they definitely have quite a few uh, cider orchards or apple orchards out there. Um, there's that's where, I, that's where I was understanding that there's a difference between the apples that you would just eat and the apples that you would make cider from. Um, and when, when the colonists were coming over, uh, they, because they, they brought a lot of stuff over from England and other parts of Europe, but most of the colonists were from England, you know, they were bringing over apple, uh, apple seeds and clippings to, to see what would grow over here, and they were making cider back then. So while they weren't successful in doing the same thing with wine at the beginning, uh, with uh, bringing in the European style wines or grapes, because uh, they kept dying and they didn't know why until phylloxera happened, about what, 100 and, well, let's see, they got here about 150 years later when the phylloxera outbreak happened in France and the rest of Europe. Um, they just thought it was just the climate here or the soil. They, just, they, they didn't really know what it was. They just, all they knew is that the grapes, the grape vines for, for uh, what they were using for wine weren't growing over here. They kept dying. So they started using whatever was native and that wasn't really the kind of wine they liked. But 
they had their cider and of course they had their beer and then of course they also had uh, liquor so the, all those industries were doing pretty well up until you know the late 1700s when they started realizing how to bring in the European grapes to make wine so okay so back to cider um, there's a lot of this is just a lot of uh, basic information or a lot of like you know percentages and dollar amounts and all we're not going to go through all that um, now they use five different I almost said grapes, five different apple varieties uh, for both of these ciders. Um, the first one is a traditional uh, cider. Also, another thing about cider in the United States, we call it hard cider. Um, that is how a traditional cider is made, but in the United States, we call it a hard cider. And it, if we call something cider in the United States, it's really apple juice. It's unfermented apple juice. So it's, it's kind of weird because they call it cider everywhere else. And because that's what fermented apple juice is, but in the United States, for some reason, we started calling it hard cider versus cider. Um, anyway, so they use five different apples, and uh, now they, they talked about how these are cider apples versus dessert apples, but some of these apple varieties I recognize. So, uh, golden russets, I've heard of russet potatoes, but r golden russets, so I'm gonna go through what they say. Uh, enhance the bouquet and aromatics and contribute complexity and fruit flavor. Granny Smiths, I've heard of those. I'm sure I've had some of those. So again, I guess these are also apples that are really good at, for um, using or making cider. Uh, they add tannic structure and tartness adding to the mouthfeel. Uh, gallus or galas, G-A-L-A-S, uh, help deliver a clean, refreshing finish. Fuji's lend just the right amount of sweetness and Red Delicious, again, another varietal I've heard of um, and I'm sure I've had you know, many times, uh, brings rich mouthfeel and distinct appley aromatic qualities. Um, I'll see here, Let's see if they go through the making of it. So they are chilled to, th oh yeah, and then they use some type of, um, get this other thing here. So, um, they ferment fresh apple juice from blah, 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 okay. They, their unique frost fermentation process concentrates the aromas and flavors resulting in refined, balanced, and refreshing blah, 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 blah. Process is complex, labor-intensive, longer, and more expensive than producing sweeter mass-market brands. Um, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I think this is what this is about to explain. So frost fermentation, so I'm guessing they, they chill the apples to 32 degrees prior to processing on a belt press. Now that's um, the thing that strips the skins off of the apples. Um, I've seen some pictures where, it's, where you have like this little, almost like a grinder, but it's, it, gets, it removes the skin. Kind of like, I guess, how you get the juice out of um, grapes, but not quite. With grape juice, you press it and then you get, you get the juice and then you have the skin still there. Uh, you get the it's kind of pomace and you also have apple pomace. Um, but anyway, so they strip the skins off um, and then the fermentation at the winery takes nine to 10 days in a series of temperature controlled stainless steel tanks, each with a different champagne, wine, or ale yeast to, con to create flavor, complexity, and balance. So again, yeast is used. That that's how the fermentation process happens. It's, it's not just a magical thing that you, uh, you have something sugary and with some starch in it that creates alcohol. You have to have yeast to create or to, to um, uh, convert all those sugars into alcohol. Uh, nitrogen levels are carefully monitored during fermentation to protect the delicate flavors and aromas control the residual sugar levels. Uh, bu -bu 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 I'll just finish reading. Frequent tastings are especially important at this stage to monitor the tannins, which are complex phenolics that added that add astringency, tang, flavor, and personality to finished ciders. The pH levels average 3.5, which also helps protect flavor profiles. Let's see. Uh, when they finish the fermentation, uh, the temperature is rapidly reduced below freezing. I guess that's what the frost fermentation is. Uh, a fining agent is added, and the cider settles for 36 hours before it is gently drawn off, filtered, and moved to a clean tank in preparation for bottling. During this process, a significant amount of slush is created. This is left behind with the sediment, which concentrates the flavors and aromas. A final series of tastings and lab measurements ensure that the proper flavor profiles acidity, tannins, and residual sugars are present before bottling. Anyway, so um, the, the people behind this, uh, they are, I guess it's not in there, I'll pull it off of here. Uh, this is 
Michael and Paul Scotto, or is it Scotto? Um, they are a fifth generation uh, family or fifth generation vintners. Um, so they say they, uh, take, they take a winemaker's approach to creating hard apple ciders. Um, and so I looked them up and they're part of a group called the J Woods Beverage Group. Um, so you can find, I mean, they have their own website, ciderbrothers.com, and I'll have the link to that below on the website. Um, make sure you visit the website too, right? And, uh, but they're part of this other group and their wines are part of this group and it's called 50 Harvests. Um, as they have a cab and that's about all I know about it. So it'd be interesting to try their wine, but there's some other wines that are part of this group along with some uh, spirits, which let me pull that up real quick. Uh, they've got one, two, three, four different types of spirits. And they have, besides the William Tell uh, ciders, they also have um, a uh, one, one called Blue Mountain and one called Pacific Coast Hard Cider. Now, one thing about this is that the William Tell and the Pacific Coast Hard Cider, they look to be very, very, very similar in uh, the, the uh, how it's described and um, in the two ciders that are available. So I'm not really sure if it's a rebranding or what, or just two different companies just using the same process. The Blue Mountain, same thing. They all use a five apple blend. So um, let's see what else. <clears throat> Both of these uh, are suggested retail of $8.99 for a 22 ounce bottle. So it's like drinking two beers. And um, uh, I have seen it on sale. I found one place online that listed its price at $7.50 from Belgrade, uh, from Belgrade Liquors in Belgrade, Montana. Yeah, I know, random, right? So let's get into some ciders here. Um, I like apple juice. I like apple juice a lot. I like apple juice with alcohol in it. Um, so that's why I was really kind of like, yeah, I'll do it. And I mean, if somebody sent me some beers, I'd review them for the show. Again, we're not gonna branch off into uh, reviewing anything that's alcohol, um, but this is kind of a little, kind of a little, little thing different here. So let's get into this. Um, <clears throat> the William Tell Hard Apple Cider. Yeah, I'm using the wine glass really just so you can see it. Um, and it's just kind of neat to use this. It's kind of like a sparkling wine. Look at that. It, says, it has a very much of a color of like a Sauvignon Blanc. Okay. When I open these up and they have like the traditional like, you know, beer bottle cap. And I don't think the vacuum bin is going to fit in there. So I'm drinking these. Anyway, um, when I open it up, you could definitely smell the apple to it. So, okay, we'll skip the obvious. It's going to smell, taste like apples. All right, we'll skip the obvious. We'll talk about other things I get off of a nose or a bouquet. Now, there's, there's kind of like this, almost like, I don't want to say cotton candy, but there's like a, a candy type of aroma coming off. You know, it's it's like it's like a um, um, like a bubblicious type of like you know chewing gum, really really extracted flavor chewing gum. <clears throat> Besides, there's apple to it, of course, but there's other aromas to that. And I really want to say it's like, you know, like just kind of like that, that traditional pink bubble gum, bubblicious um, aroma to it. But it's pretty much dominated by apples. Um, it's clean. It's very refreshing. It all feels, it feels like there's, you know, there's carbonation in it. So um, if it feels like you're getting that carbonation, maybe, you know, you're smelling CO2. I don't know if you can smell CO2, but... I mean, you know, apparently, you know, obviously you probably can't smell CO because they have carbon monoxide, you know, detectors, but I can't imagine you could smell CO2 either. But it, you have that fir that um, carbonation type of quality to it, even on the nose. And there's almost a hint of banana, really, like banana taffy. Now, bananas in wine usually are not, banana flavor or aroma in wine is usually not a good sign. 
They use it has something to do with the yeast, if I remember correctly. But I guess the cider is going to be okay. So let's check it out. It pretty much tastes like it smells. Like, there really is that banana taffy. I mean, again, remember, it's loads of apples. So I'm trying to peel off those lay layers of apple and get you the secondary and tertiary flavors. Um, but yeah, there's 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 almost like a, a banana taffy to it. Um, even a bit, again, that kind of bubblicious bubble gum. But there's something else to this. This is really good, by the way. And it's going to, you know, obviously things like this are going to taste because there's a, there's a residual sweetness to it. Um, I don't know if it, if it gives you the residual sugars, if at all. I don't know if they, they have to. Not that they have to, but I don't know if they if they have that on here, even if it's on the label, if it's... See, I, see here's another thing. They have a nutrition label on here, whereas wine doesn't. Um, by the way, total fat, zero grams. Sodium, 11 milligrams. Carbs, 10 grams. Sugars, eight grams. So eight grams, not even eight grams per liter. So eight grams per per 12 ounces, because that's a, uh, that's a serving size. So, man. Uh, and it doesn't even have it here. It says hard cider, fructose, malic acid, less than 1% natural flavors, sulfites, and sorbate uh, for flavor protection. 6% alcohol. You know, I want to say sorbate has something to do with gum, too. Bubble gum. I don't know. I have to look that up. Not right now. Uh, maybe between the two, I'll look it up. Um, but, uh, so, what did I say? Eight grams of sugar? So yeah, that's well just well just a rough estimate that you know let's see there's twenty well there's uh, twenty four ounces to a, a bottle of wine so but they do it by grams per liter so let's just you know multiply that by four that's thirty two plus another let's say we'll just add another four to five grams so yeah that's you know like forty grams of sugar per liter so yes it will be sweet it is equivalent of a um, Demi sec, I think, sparkling wine. It's really good. Now here's the, here's what I want to talk about too. This does not taste like all those mass produced ciders that you get, or hard ciders. I'm sorry, that you get um, from all over. They really do taste like a red apple that you just bit into. And they're good, but they really taste like apple juice with a bit of ferment, you know, that with alcohol in it and some and some carbonation. And they're not bad. I really enjoy them. But this is a much cleaner, cleaner taste to it. I mean, it, there, it feels like it's not just apples. It feels like there's other, I mean, I know there's other stuff in there, but you can really taste other uh, flavors. There's other aromas to it. Um, it looks like a wine, okay? It's not that red, it's not that um, darker amber colored. Um, so, I mean, it's it's obviously not meant to be like a mass-produced hard cider. And it's really good. I'm like, I'm very impressed with it. And there's just this other flavor aroma that I just cannot get out of my head that I cannot for the life of me figure out what I'm getting out of it, but it's good. It is really good. And I highly suggest if you find this somewhere, this one particular you want to get. All right. So, um, I forgot what I was going to look up. I'm not going to worry about it. We're going to move on to the next hard cider. All right. So let's hit the next cider real quick. Um, Pressable, that is the company that is my, um, get that out of the way, that is my web hosting company. I like to thank Kai and everybody down there at, uh, down at Pressable down in Geekdom here in San Antonio for supplying me with that and with the sticker so I can proudly, proudly, um, you know, display who is my uh, um, website host or my WordPress hosting company. So I really appreciate that. Uh, it's a really nice shirt. I mean, it feels really nice too. So, um, 
make sure they gave me a double X. Yeah, it needs to become smaller at some point. All right, so um, next, we're gonna do the William Tell hard cider, Pinot Grigio hard apple cider. Now, just like I said, there was, um, I probably don't need to rinse it, but I'm going to. Um, just like I said, that other, you know, they have two other uh, cider uh, under the under that, um, whatchamacallit website, uh, J. Woods Beverage. Um, the Pacific Coast has a Pinot Grigio and uh, apple cider. Blue Mountain does not. Um, but they have the Eden Ridge Semi-Sweet, the Semi-Hard Dry Apple Cider, and the Cherry Hard Apple Cider. So interesting. And the first two I mentioned were from Oregon. Whereas, of course, these are California. So again, I'm not, I'm not really sure with cider um, if Appalachian is as, as strictly controlled as it is with uh, grapes. <clears throat> but let's check it out. Now, this is really intriguing because they, they add 15% uh, Pinot Grigio grapes um with this so it's gonna be interesting to see how that is i mean they don't they don't mention like where the pinot grigio grape, grapes come from but um let's check it out again it looks like a white wine has a little bit of fuzz fizz fuzz fizz to it you obviously can see it was carbonated still all right on on the nose it, it's I don't want to say indistinguishable from the other one, but it's not like a sign. I don't get like a significant change, but that might, you know, who knows? Maybe that'll change over time here. It really, it really pretty much smells like the other one. I, from smell alone, I would not be able to tell the difference. It has all the same types of aromas that kind of, and actually has less, you know, it has less of the bubblicious bubble gum. It has, but it still has that banana taffy component to it. Again, very similar, but there's there's a bit of a difference. It actually feels smoother, um, and it feels like I can get a little bit of wine quality out of it. You know, um, it, it's 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 very subtle, uh, maybe because I know that there's Pinot Grigio in it that I, I'm feeling that because I'm trying to look for that. I think I'm really just trying to find out what the differences are. But it feels like there's there, there's a, a different acidity to it. Almost, it really has feels like there's more wine acidity to it rather than the other one, which had more of a regular, um, you know, regular acidity. There is a slight difference to it. You know, honestly. This one tastes more apple-y. And it's not like overwhelming or overpowering apple. Like I said, we, obviously there's apple flavor and aroma to it, but it's not overwhelming. Um, with the Pinot Grigio, it's, it's a little more subtle. It's, it's, it's more reduced. It's actually probably kind of nice. I like it. I like either one. Um, I mean, I guess, you know, this one has a little more apple flavor to it than the Pinot Grigio one does. Um, they're both about the same price. Uh, I would definitely recommend either one if you can find it in a store somewhere. Um, chill it, uh, drink it like a beer. Um, you don't have to, you can put it in a wine glass if you'd like. I think it'd be kind of a great way to drink it rather than just putting it in a beer mug or drinking it right out of the bottle. But um, it's nice. This segment's really short compared to the first one. Um, so let's do housekeeping. I got a couple minutes. Um, so just an update on the whole RSS feed thing. Uh, TiVo obviously is now working. For those of you who have been watching on TiVo, um, it's, everything's still there. Though uh, the person that I talked to said he, had a, he, he didn't have to resubscribe, but it didn't look like it was showing up. But it doesn't matter. He was able to find it with no problem. Uh, Roku. So um, I finally got a Roku box, and I got uh, and now I see where my iFood TV stuff is. Now it's under iWine.tv, and that's where it looks like 
about all of my videos are. If you're trying to find me under the iFood.tv app under Roku, you're only gonna see four episodes and they, and they and we try to watch them, they won't, they, nothing happens. So you have to go to iWine.tv. Now, here's the thing that I'm a little bit confused about and it's not just the iWine, it's also YouTube app on, on, the, on the Roku. There's no rhyme or reason to how it's ordered, how, how it shows up. Um, at least with the, the YouTube one, my more recent ones were, were easy to find or you could find them quicker. Um, with the iWine, it took me minutes. I mean, like four or five minutes of scrolling, just constant scrolling. And then I kept seeing repeats of the same stuff. And then eventually it would bring on new things as I'm scrolling through it. And I finally found newer ones. But the one I found, the newest one I found was episode 301. So it was missing the, the two episodes after that. So I don't know how, how their app works. I'm gonna give them that feedback saying it'd be better if there's a way to sort things. Uh, if you could get into that person's channel and then you could sort it by whatever, or if you can, I don't know, if you, if you don't know what the name of the title is, it's kind of hard to, to do a search, but if there's a way within their channel to sort by most views or to sort by name or date added or something like that, I mean, it really, I think is helpful because when you're dealing with something like mine, which is episodic content, which... Um, does happen from episode to episode to episode, and it's not necessarily a self-contained thing that um, I don't refer back to other stuff. I mean, I think really, to me, it makes more sense to, to, to show it like as a television series and not just a bunch of videos on someone's website. And I have to admit, when I go to people's websites that have video or even just regular written stuff, and there's no date on it, and I don't know which one's the most recent, which was the oldest, it really, really irritates me. Uh, partially because I want to make sure that the place is still updated. This, this is recent um, and not something that was written five years ago, and that's the last post. So, um, if, especially if that's the first one to show up. So, that's why my stuff is in the order that it, you know, for the newest is on top, and then you can go back farther. Um, iTunes still not there yet. Um, I've got some ideas on fixing all this. Um, this will probably also translate into the TiVo side of things, but. Um, looking at using a, another hosting service that will have only the most recent stuff, probably five, maybe 10 episodes worth. But here's the kicker. Um, I'm gonna be reducing the file size of the video to about a fifth of what it is now that if you watch on the Blip player or if you watch on the iTunes. Oh, by the way, the iPhone app still works. I still can get, I still see my stuff on iTunes through the iPhone app, just not on the computer. So. Um, this will help with, um, and the reason I'm gonna reduce the file size by by a fifth of what it is now is because that is about four episodes a month. That's about the, the hits, hits the 1.5 gigabyte storage, uh, monthly storage, um, whatever, limit on one of the places. And it's not prohibitively expensive to do it there. And then uh, they have unlimited bandwidth. So once you download it, it, I'm not worried about how many downloads I have. And that's really the concern with TiVo rather than iTunes. If I get something on TiVo that gets 1,000 or 2,000 views versus the usual five to 700, and it keeps growing, by the way, um, slowly but surely, you're getting more and more views. Um, but uh, if I get you know a whole bunch of views and I don't have unlimited bandwidth, I don't want to be hit with a $10,000 bill at the end of the month. So um, that's the idea of what we're going to do with that. Um, and once I establish where I'm going to host the, the video files sp sp specifically for an RSS feed, which is for TiVo and iTunes and anywhere else that's going to have an RSS feed, um, I'll figure that out. I had somebody who was supposed to contact me yesterday. This is, for, oh, by the 4th of July today, so I'm working for you. Um, but they were supposed to contact me yesterday. They were supposed to contact me a few days ago, and they haven't done it. I don't know what type of offer they were going to make for me, um, but as of right now, I haven't heard back from him uh, to find out what's going on. So I'm going to pursue these other things. I'm also looking to see if I can do this through BitTorrent, um, which I know people, oh, BitTorrent, it's illegal stuff. You have to understand, BitTorrent has a lot of legitimate uses, um, especially for stuff like mine, which high, you know, high, uh, or, or high um, uh, large file sizes, I'm sorry and potentially high bandwidth. If I'm able to do the BitTorrent thing, we'll go back to having 1.5 gigabyte files. Um, but what I've seen of the 300-ish to 400 megabyte file, the video for it looks really good. It's the, it's the file size that's on YouTube 
So I looked at that and it looks just as good as when I watch it on the full file size. So, so we're probably gonna do that. It just helps reduce file size, um, helps reduce upload time, and uh, that's it. All right, so that's gonna wrap it up for today. Um, as always, I wanna thank everyone for stopping by. Hit the links above to friend me up. Hit that donate button over there. Uh, click the links below as far as more information about the ciders uh, and anything else, and uh, check out everything else on the website. Um, and this will now, you know, starting pretty soon, if you want to see anything older than about five or ten episodes, you're going to have to come to the website to see it, which that's how people find it anyway. I know from the web searches. Um, and uh, we will see everyone again next time. Peace.